the sense this morning, it's just this incredible call just to once again, just to check our lives, to check our hearts, to check our focus. Just are we engaged in things that the Father doesn't want us to be engaged in? And are, is our attention being caught up by things that are not of the Father? And is at the foundation of our lives the, the, the same call that was in David's life, just to be saying nothing else will matter but you, God? And if the music did fall away, if the music is stripped away, if everything that is in your life is stripped away and all it is is just you and God, would that be enough? I know it's a scary thought. We get so accustomed and used to doing things in a certain manner. And it's one of the things that I always challenge our leaders and I challenge myself is like, God, if this morning you show up in this way, it's okay. It doesn't matter about our agenda. It doesn't matter about our plans. And, and God at the moment, I think, is, is starting to mess those things up in our lives. And we've got to be okay with it. We've got to be okay with him messing up our routines, our habits. You know, those wonderful things that we get into. Jesus came into this world and the religious leaders and the people of the day thought he would do things in a certain manner. And he did it in a completely opposite manner. And I think sometimes, you know, as believers, okay, I'll say I, okay, we expect God to do certain things in a certain manner. Don't put your hand up. <laughs> but we have this perception and idea and almost sometimes a conviction that, God, you should be doing it this way. <laughs> and God shows up in a completely different way and does things in a completely different manner. And then we stand back in amazement and go, I wonder why I didn't trust you in the first place. <laughs> you know, we've got this history of trusting him and him doing things in an incredible way. That's, that's fine. Not a problem. And, and he does it in a different way. But when we're going through the circumstance and when we're going through the trials and tribulations, we sometimes forget that God, God does it in a different way. We sometimes try and put our agenda onto God's agenda. We sometimes try and put our convictions onto God. Even this morning as I looked at those names, we, we sometimes have taken on names that God hasn't given to us. And God's busy stripping those names off so that we can walk uprightly before Him. So I've been busy with a, a topic of the Father's business. And over the last two weeks, I've just shared that I believe that the Father's business is about the single person. God is interested in the individual. He's not so much interested in everything that's taking place. And last week, I shared a little bit about the struggle, that there's the, the forces of darkness trying to come in, and it says that darkness will cover the face of the earth. But I believe at the same time, there's this there's this fight that's happening in the heaven is that the glory of the knowledge of Jesus will also cover the earth. And two are happening at the same time, simultaneously, all the time, at every given stage. And, and I want to say that, that this fight is taking place. And we've got a choice whether we want to be on the, on the side of spreading the knowledge of Jesus or whether we want to be on the side of spreading the darkness. And it's a choice that we get to make on a daily basis as we stand up out of our bed. We can say, oh, glory, what a wonderful day I'm serving Jesus. Or I can stand up and go, oh, goodness, not another day that I've got to face the enemy. <laughs> you don't have to smile at me. But the struggle is, is that we're in a fight. When we came to Jesus, this wasn't going to be easy. It says when we came to Jesus, we, we stepped into a war. And there's this war going on right now, and it's the, the war of the knowledge of Jesus spreading across the earth and the glory of the Lord covering the face of the earth 
as the waters cover the sea. And at the same time, the enemy is going, well, darkness wants to cover the earth. And then there's this constant fight and battle taking place. And, and I want to say that the fight is for people's lives. The darkness that comes in, it's about a, a darkness over the minds of people. It's a darkness over people's lives that they would be so subdued and so despondent that they cannot see the hope that is found in Jesus. That's the darkness that's trying to come in and penetrate the earth, that the, the struggles that you see and all the things that are taking place in the earth right now is to make you and I despondent, to lose hope, to lose courage, and to not arise and shine and almost, can I say, get caught up in our bed of despair. God, why on earth must I stand up tomorrow morning? It's Monday. <laughs> There's no hope. What, have, what good am I here on earth, God. Why have you placed me here? And there's this fight going on in our minds. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds that take root in our minds and in our lives. And it's the, the weapons are spiritual. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. I'm not fighting against Desmond tomorrow morning. Lucky, huh? Eh? I wasn't called in for a meeting last week. It's fantastic. But the fight isn't in our flesh. The fight is a spiritual fight that's taking place, and it's the, it's the fight of darkness, or it's the fight of knowledge of Jesus. In your life right now, it's the fight of darkness and despair and destruction and chaos and confusion and despondency setting in because of all that's taking place in the world. Or it's the, I'm going to spend time in his presence and to now allow the glory of the Lord to rise in me, to shine on me, to allow hope to come into my life, to be able to, having done all, stand and allow the presence of God to shine forth because where there is light, darkness cannot be. The moment in a dark room you switch on a torch, or when you light a candle, it doesn't matter how small the light is. The darkness has to flee. And the problem is that we're getting caught up in all the narratives that are taking place in the world, and we're allowing darkness to set into our lives, and we're forgetting that we're the light of the world. We're forgetting that we're the sons and daughters who, having done all, stand, but having done all, we're also called to spread his news, to spread the gospel, to spread the good news that God is alive. He's still seated on his throne. Darkness isn't found in heaven. Darkness isn't found in heaven. He's still in control. And I serve an alive God who knows my tomorrow, he knows the next day, he knows what my future holds, and I can be confident in today that no matter what the enemy is going to throw at me, I can, having done all, stand and praise his name. Having done all, I can allow that word to penetrate my life and allow his light to shine forth in me and be the hope for this world. Because as Jesus came in, he didn't come in to change, and this is where I have to repent. No, I don't have to repent. But he didn't come in to change governments. Jesus didn't arrive to change governments. It says the government is on his shoulders anyway. He didn't come to change institutions. He didn't come to change these organizations. He came to change people's lives. One-on-one, -on -one, individuals, connecting them with the Father so that have, they would have a personal, intimate, confident hope, not in me, not in you, but in Jesus. Because when we, our hope is founded in Jesus, we can face the trials and tribulations, we can face the winds and waves that the world may throw at us, and we can hear his name saying, come out onto the water. Come walk with me through the storms. Come walk with me through the valley of shadow of death. Come walk with me on the high plains. Come walk with me. Is what Jesus is calling us to. And his instruction to us, as he left, he says, go and do likewise. Go and do what? Go and connect people with me. Go and introduce people to me. Go and share the good news that I'm alive. That's the gospel. 
And so this morning, part three of the Father's business, the next slide says, and I want to remind us, is that we cannot be about the Father's business and my own business. I've got to come, and this is this morning, we've got to come back to a place of surrender and say, Lord, not, your, not my will, but your will be done. Not my way, but your way. And that's the heart of worship. That's the heart of sacrifice. That's the heart of coming and pleasing our Father, is coming back to that place of surrender, coming back to that place of saying, okay, God, I heal to your ways. I heal to the way that you want to do things, and I want to stop doing things in my own strength. And I want to be about the Father's business. I want to be doing the things that the Father has called me to do. And so this morning as we finish off, I want to look at one of the foundations of this family. And it's found on the top word. I want to look at the word reach this morning. Because the Father's business is about reaching. It's as simple as that. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he reached out to us. And gave us his son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so this morning I want to look at the word reach and I want to give us just some. Oh, I've got lots of time this morning. How did that happen? Oh, we pray for lots of people later. And so we all look at reach and just give us some pointers on the Father's business. So the word. The letter R I want to say to us this morning is I want to encourage us to reach out. R stands for reach out. As Jesus started his ministry, he called 12 guys. He says, come follow me. It was Jesus' instruction to his disciples. And I want to say for us as believers, as sons and daughters, and living in the age that we're living in, that we need to get rid of our boundary walls and invite people into our lives and say to those people that God has called us to walk with, say, come follow me. I don't know everything, but as I walk with the Father, He does reveal things to me, and I want to share those things with you. Come walk with me. I want to invite you in. I want to reach out to the people that Jesus has called me to reach out and say to them, come walk with me. I want to invite you in. I want to get rid of my six-foot vibrocrete wall that's around my life. I want to get rid of my fear, my anxiety about connecting with people, and I want to invite people into my life. And it's a twofold way because there are going to be people that get you, invite you in, and there are going to be people that you invite in. Because that's how it works in the family of God. It works two ways. That you get an invite, but you're also called to invite. And Jesus' invitation was, come be a part of my family. As Jesus says, do you want to believe in me and be a part of my family? As we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we were invited into the family of God. No restrictions. No barriers. No withhold. Because of Jesus, we have access to everything. God's not sitting in, in heaven right now and saying, I'm, I'm withholding things from you. He's hidden things for you, but he's not withholding things from you. Can I say that again? He's hidden things for you to find, but he's not withholding things from you. And in our lives, we've got to have the same mentality that as I walk and I come across people that God's called me to minister to them or be friends with them or just be someone to them is to say, come, I want to invite you in. Come have a meal with me. Come live life with me. Oh, that's scary. You alive out there? You know what my household looks like. I'm not sure I want to invite people into my household. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to invite people in because then they might see that I'm not perfect. <laughs> no. Jesus reached out to us first and took us the way that we were and then says, go and do likewise. 
The disciples weren't perfect. And I, if I ask across the room this morning, I, I bet you that nine, of, nine times out of ten, most of us wouldn't have invited those 12 disciples to be around Jesus. He takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Whoops. And so this morning, R is, I want to encourage us as a family that we've got to start reaching out. We've got to start engaging with the people around about us. And remember, I'm not asking you to engage with multitudes because one of the things, I mean, I grew up as well, I was an introvert. Believe it or not, my wife changed me. She was the party animal. <laughs> it doesn't matter your characteristics. It doesn't matter how God's designed you. Because we need the introverts as much as the extroverts. We need the the quiet ones who are actually interceding in the backgrounds as the ones that are speaking out and then have to change gears because they've changed their mind so many times. <laughs> I can see I'm talking to some people here. Don't worry. It takes all sorts to make the world go round, eh? And God's called us as a family and said, I want you to reach out. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert, extrovert. It doesn't matter if you... Know everything or know nothing. Because it's not about us, it's about Him. It's about sharing Jesus with us. It's about saying, I've got this testimony that I was once in darkness, but now because of Jesus, He invited me into light, and I want to share my story with you. It doesn't matter if it's a big story or a little story. It's still the story that Jesus impacted your life, and because He's impacted your life, you now have life, and life eternal. And because you have Jesus, you can walk through circumstances and situations. You can walk through lockdown. You can walk through whatever. You can put your... But because I have Jesus, I can walk through it with him. He's with me. He's carrying me. And I want to share that testimony. I want to share my story. And I want to invite someone into my life. Start with the one. I didn't ask you to start with 300. Start with the one. Because God's interested in the one. And if God's interested in the one, then I should also be interested in the one. And for some of us sitting in the room, we're going to be called to minister just to one. For some of us, we're going to be called to minister to tens and twenties and thirties, and that's okay. In God's eyes, we're equal. As long as we're doing His will. The R stands for reach out. E stands for Evangelize. John 3, 16, we've read it already. Turn to Mark 16. We often read this verse out of Matthew, but Mark 16, evangelize. And evangelize is simply this. I don't want to make it a big thing, and I don't want to make it a thing that we're fearful of. Evangelize is simply sharing the good news of Jesus with somebody. It doesn't necessarily mean that you lead them to the Lord. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to pray for them afterwards. It just simply means that you share the good news that Jesus came for them. And you might be the one that sows the seed. Someone else might be the one that waters and somebody else might be the one that harvests. But it's all the same story. It's that Jesus has come to give us life and life in abundance. And in Mark 15, sorry, Mark 16, Verse 15, it says, Jesus, as he leaving his disciples, says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. A lot of creatures running around earth at the moment. Jesus says, Go and preach the gospel. Go and tell them the good news. Go and share your story. I don't know if you've noticed, I've noticed a little bit over the last two or three weeks as we started sharing, how many opportunities have you had to suddenly people have got coughs and sniffs and you go like, do I pray for them now or don't I? <laughs> but God's giving us opportunities to share his good news. 
We're living in a world that's in crisis right now. We're, we're living in a world that's full of despair. We're living in a world that's in darkness right now. And you and I have the good news. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to put it under our pillow and sleep on it at night? Or are we going to allow the bucket to be lifted and the light and the good news to come out? Is our choice. And it's not a scary thing. It doesn't have to be this Christian needs. Let me tell you that. Get rid of your your paradigms and your convictions. Hey, I, I was walking uh, today and, and I was short on groceries. And I really just prayed to God and, and God sent someone across my path and I gave me groceries. That's the good news of you prayed, God heard your prayer, and he answers prayers. That's the good news. Hey, I see you sick. Can I pray for you? As you pray for that person, it's good news because it shows that you care. And it doesn't have to be this long, drawn-out preach that you have to give someone every time you think you have to evangelize. Let me cut that at the kneecaps. Just speak English. <laughs> yeah? The world doesn't want to hear our Christian needs. The world wants to hear our hearts. And if we haven't had an encounter with Jesus, pray to Jesus and ask him for an encounter. And let me tell you, sometimes the darkness covers our story and we forget what Jesus has done for us. And I want to remind you this morning, it's the treasure box that my mother often talks about. Open up the treasure box and look over your life and just see what Jesus has done in it. And just remind yourself, because that also helps the darkness flee, as you remind yourself how Jesus has provided for you, as you remind yourself how Jesus has healed for you, as you remind yourself as Jesus set you free and he opened prison doors in your life, as you remind yourself just what an incredible Savior, loving friend he is to you, as you remind yourself the darkness has to flee and light comes in and you can once again see the way that Jesus sees your circumstances and situations and you once again remind yourself, hey, I actually have a story to tell somebody. You alive out there? Evangelize. Share your story. Reach out. Tell people how good Jesus is. What's A? Turn with me to Isaiah 61. Well-known portion of Scripture. But A stands for action. We shared last week that the kingdom of God is advancing and the violent take it by force. Is it right? We did share that last week. So if I'm going to take it by force, it means I'm going to have to be doing some action, right? Well, Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me to preach. Preach is an action. Good tidings to the poor. So I, there's an action that I need to do in order to see good tidings come to the poor. Do you, do you read that in your scripture? Hello? You read that? And then it says that he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Well, in order for the brokenhearted to be healed, I need to be able to connect my ears to the Father's ears and speak the words that the Father is speaking to them to see their brokenheartedness healed. There's an action. I don't just come and stand before Desmond. Desmond's told me he's got a broken heart and I, and I just don't wait and I wait by osmosis and I know something's going to happen now. No, there's an action that's something I've got to do. If I know that he's sick, it means I've got to lay my hands on him. Action. <laughs> if someone is broken hearted, it means I've got to have compassion and I've got to go to them, show them compassion. There's an action that's got to happen. The the word of God isn't passive. The kingdom of God isn't passive. The kingdom of God is about going. The kingdom of God is about doing. But I'm a being who's doing the will of the Father. I'm about my Father's business. What does it say else? Did I get, a, did I get through it? No, it says, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Oh, darn it, I've got to open up my mouth. Because proclamation doesn't happen like this.
Now I've got to open up my mouth and proclaim, hey, Jesus has come to set you free. He's opened up your prison door. And if you would receive him this morning, if you would listen to him and Holy Spirit, won't you come now and show them that it's possible for prison doors to be open? I've got to proclaim. Open up my mouth. There's an action that has to take place. All we see is the the brokenhearted healed and, and the captives are set free and the prison doors open. But it doesn't happen just because of the word of God. There's an action and a responsibility because the spirit of the Lord God is upon you. He has anointed you to do something. I'll get three of you excited this morning. But there's an action that has to take place. I cannot just sit in my house. I cannot just sit in my chair. I cannot just come to church on a Sunday morning and think the world's going to change if I do not allow the Spirit of the Lord God to rest on me that when I walk into my office on Monday morning, when I walk into my community on, on Monday morning, when I walk into the shopping mall, I cannot just expect for the captives to be set free if I'm not going to proclaim it. I cannot see the sick and healed if I'm not prepared to lay my hands on them. And it's a challenge because we like our comfort zones. It's a challenge because we like doing things the way we do it. We like our routines. We like the way that life is right now. It's very comfortable. But God's calling us to go. If we're going to see his, the knowledge of Jesus cover the face of the earth like the waters cover the sea, it's going to take sons and daughters who are prepared to go and do. We're not doings. But we are beings. I'm about the Father's business, like Jesus was. And part of being about the Father's business is I have a responsibility because the anointing of God is on my life to be able to proclaim, to be able to lay my hands on them, to be able to set people free, to see blind eyes open, to see even if I have to spit in the ground and put mud on people's eyes, there's an action involved in doing that, then I'll do it. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Again, I've got to open up my mouth. The day of the vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. There's another action. Comforting people. You don't feel comforted just by someone standing at a distance, do you? Whoops. Okay. To console all those who are mourning right now. Consoling is an action. I cannot console you from a distance. I cannot console you sitting in my bed and going, I hope you're consoled right now. No, I've got to get up and go. To give them beauty for ashes, if we want to see beauty for ashes, if we want to see the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, then we're going to have to get up and start doing. Action. So we been called to reach out, we've been called to evangelize, there's an action, C stands for, we've been called to care. Turn with me to John chapter 15. And these are all things we should know, but every now and again have to be reminded of. John 15 verse 9 says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that your joy, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So if you're not feeling very joyful at the moment, maybe you need to abide in the Father's love a bit more. Mm. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, and to lay down one's life for his friends. Part of reaching out and part of being about the Father's business is I've got to have a heart that is laid down to care for others. Jesus said he came not to rule but to serve. And at the foundation of my life and what God's busy doing and calling us to is that we've got to have a heart that once again cares. Care for people, care for the individual, care for the destitute, care for the lonely, care for those that are 
brokenhearted, care for those that are downtrodden, care for whoever God brings across your path to care for. We're going to have a heart because God so loved us first and invited us in. And I've got to have the same heart that he had, and that's to care for others. And then lastly, the H stands for helps. I'm going to put another word there as well, just because of this family. Together with helps, I want to say hospitality. <laughs> I think the two go hand in hand to some degree. Okay, and in John chapter 12, verse 23, it says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, him my Father will honor I say it again? If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Part of caring is the understanding that we've also been called to help and to be hospitable. Which means, again, my house has got to be open, my life has got to be open. To invite people in to show the caring side and the help side that people need so desperately right now. And I've got to lay down my life. If anyone lays down his life, he will have life eternal. But if I pick up my life, and all I'm worried about is me, myself, and I, there's a problem. My father will not honor that person, according to what Jesus says. And I want to be honored by the father. <laughs> And so we've been called, as we are about the Father's business, the challenge this morning is, are we prepared to reach out? Reach out, evangelize, put into action the Word of God, care for one another, help and be hospitable to others. And if you turn with me to Romans chapter 10, It got very quiet here. Don't worry, this word challenges me just as much as it challenges you. Because life can be very comfortable. And um, it's quite often, as Desmond and I were just talk talking this week a little bit, it's quite often it's in our discomfort or in the most inappropriate times that we get that phone call for a help, for a care. Anyone agree with that? <laughs> yeah? It's usually in the most inappropriate times. But Jesus says, if you lay down your life for my sake, you will gain eternal life. And we've got to get out of our comfort zones. We've got to get out of our routines. And I often laughed as I grew up, and we, it was a household joke. We'd often sit down at 5 o'clock for our, our supper as a family, and inevitably, the telephone would ring, and it would be someone in need. I learned, we learned how to eat very fast. Not a good habit, but it was the only way. But it's usually at the most inappropriate times that you get the phone call for caring, for helping, for being hospitable. And in that moment, your action will determine whether someone comes into an encounter with Jesus or they're missing. Romans chapter 10, we'll finish off with this. Verse 13 says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call on, him, call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written... And this is the word I want to speak over you this morning. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, 
who bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful are your feet? Of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I want to challenge us as a family this morning. Are we going to be a family that has beautiful feet? (laughs) Or are we going to be a family that hides and preserves but loses it in the end, the things that God's given to us? Because that which you hold on, you lose. That which you give away, multiplies. What, sir? So I want us this morning just to take a moment, and, it's a, and it's, a, it's a personal check for each one individually. This is not something that I can force you to do. I don't come and I don't. I won't be visiting you tomorrow morning at your house just to check that you did it. It's a personal decision between you and Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, and saying, "I want to be one that has beautiful feet." And I want to be one that spreads good news. I want to be one that spreads glad tidings. And what is those things? What is the good news? Well, it's the ability to comfort those that are mourning. It's the ability to proclaim liberty to those that have been held captive. It's the recovery of sight for those that are blind. It's the opening of deaf ears and eyes. And and you can put all those things that you've been hearing about for so many years while sitting in this family, it's taking those things and putting them into action. That when you see someone who's in despair or distraught, not just to ignore them, but to go across and say, hey, can I give you some good news? Or, hey, can I pray with you? Or, hey, can I just put my arm around you and and let the, the love of Jesus that rests in my life rest on you? But sometimes we don't even have to... Say something. Like I can come and just put my hand and just say, Jesus, just won't you minister to my wife right now? The love of the Father. And allow that love just to be shared. Because the Holy Spirit's at work in people's lives. Before I even got into the moment or in the situation, the Holy Spirit was there. So I want us just to take a moment and say, hey, I want to be a part of this. I want to be about the Father's business. And so, Father, this morning, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Father, that the seed would fall on fertile soil. And, Father, I pray not only just for myself, but for everyone that's seated here in this building right now who's saying, I want to reach out. God, I pray right now that you would impart to us the love of the Father in an incredible measure that would drive away fear, that would drive away any anxiety of the ability to reach out to others. And Father, once again, stir up in our lives the ability just to love others the way that you loved us. That when we see those that are mourning, when we're seeing those that are held captives, when we're seeing those that are in despair or despondent, God, that we would have this word in season that would cause life to go into that person's life again. Father, give us the ability to care for others. Give us the ability to help others to be hospitable. And Father, above all, give us the ability just to show them how much you love them. Because you first loved us. So Holy Spirit, I pray this morning that you would quicken inside of us once again the heart of love that the Father has for us. The ability to see the way the Father sees. And that we would be sons and daughters that do arise and do shine. Because the anointing is on our lives to proclaim the acceptable here of God. In our generation. To see the the joy once again filling our streets. To see people loving each other like they're supposed to. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.